education emergency. As Syrian students continue to flee the chaos in their country, we at Context are crossing borders for this special story. Five years, it's a long time. It's the age at which most kids first step into a classroom. It's also how long it takes many students to finish university. But what if you were waiting around for five years with no hope in sight? Syria is still under siege. Unfortunately, children and students are caught in the crossfire. Our Molly Thomas went to find out their story. We hear about it constantly in the headlines, yet many of us have become desensitized to the situation in Syria. Five years into the bloody civil war and the numbers begin to blur. Since 2011, the United Nations says 220,000 Syrians have been killed and 11 million people have been displaced. Economic sanctions, suspension from the Arab League, diplomats pulled and consistent calls for a ceasefire have not been enough to stop the bloody conflict. To make matters worse, ISIS is taking advantage of the power vacuum, seizing territory and torturing anyone that opposes an Islamic caliphate. UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon calls the Syrian people victims of the worst humanitarian crisis of our time. While bullets and bombs rain down on Syrian soil, the emotional and economic weight of four million refugees lie within the region. Syrians are spread out across Turkey, Lebanon, Egypt, Iraq, and the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan. Though Jordan never signed the 1951 Refugee Convention, it's heroically responding to more than 600,000 traumatized Syrians. Um, we look around this camp, I mean, people have set up shops, they've set up businesses. We hope and pray that the conflict will be over in Syria so that refugees can go back to their country safely. But this is going to be, I mean, a long time till this will happen. With no end to the civil war in sight, one must wonder about the next generation. There's students like Hussam, a teenager who trekked 70 kilometers with his elderly parents and young siblings to escape the chaos. His smile may mask the terror, but his inner war wounds cry out from the classroom. A bomb fell on your school yes. while you were studying? Yes, when I studied. And you ran out of the building? What happened? Tell me. Ah, um, yes. The buildings uh, fell and uh, another uh, built nearby the school and it's filled. And uh, after this, some from my friend uh, died, and uh, another teacher died. And so we uh, ran very far to our house to, to, to hide us. Like Hussam, the children we met are so desensitized to the situation in Syria, danger doesn't even phase them anymore. But you still want to go to school. You still want to go? Yes. You're not scared to go to school? Yes, yes. I no, don't scare from this bombing because I, uh, I hear every day uh, this uh, bombing and uh, the airplane. I watch it. This is action. <laughs> what I say? That's life. It's yeah. life for you. This is life in Syria. We call it like a lost generation, yeah. and what we're trying to do is, is to avoid that. You have children that have been traumatized, most have seen something. However, um, the needs are greater than what can be dealt with at this point. So there are children that are still out of school and, and still require a lot of, of support in terms of psychosocial support. To combat the trauma, international organizations are trying to make refugee camps feel more like homes. Just to our side here is uh, basically primary school. This would go up to uh, probably up to grade eight or nine, something okay. like that, okay. yeah. So there are opportunities if you're younger. Azraq is Jordan's newest camp. It's been running for a year and a half now. It was built with capacity in mind and can house up to 50,000 people. 
Every corner of the camp is complex, even these giant water tanks, which trickle down to 18,000 Syrians. The scarcity of water in Jordan is really hard, so that's why, like, uh, we just have the optimum level like to provide each beneficiary. So it's up to 35 liters per day per person. Though basic needs are being met, Azraq feels isolated and lonely. You can't leave the camp. It's about 100 kilometers east of the capital, and it's literally in the middle of the desert. <laughs> Unless you're creative like this father, it's hard to keep yourself occupied. Like time flies by, but it's but time is sweet. Life is, is sweet. nice. Life is nice. <laughs> you can still say that, eh? It's a good thing. When many people think refugees, they assume that these people are living in refugee camps. But here in Jordan, the majority of Syrian refugees are actually living in host communities like here in Zarqa. Now the problem with this is that services can be scarce and scattered. The UN says that two-thirds of Syrians living like this are actually in poverty. This is our bedroom. Nizar's family is a part of that demographic. Four energetic children confined to a tiny dilapidated space. Notice the roof. Yeah, that's for the fan, but there's we don't have anything. Uh, Electricity-wise as well, like uh, it's not safe. Yeah, because open cords. Yes. Nizar is well educated. With a bachelor and master's degree, he was working towards his PhD. When was the moment that you knew you had to leave your home country? Once that uh, shooting started, I had already packed a uh, bag with all our clothes. So they fled to Jordan, forced to leave extended family behind. Have you lost anyone close to you in this conflict? My older brother got arrested and later on we've heard the news that he was killed. In the family we are eight boys and seven girls. Right now in, in Jordan we've got three boys and one girl. And we don't know much about the rest of us. If any is uh, happened to have passed away, may he or she rest in peace. Syrians are not allowed to work in Jordan, so Nizar volunteers, which brings in $40 a week, and that barely covers rent. Even the rent is only has peas there, yeah. What worries me the most is my children's future. The closest school to our home is 15 minutes away, uh, walking. I don't have the ability to pay for a bus from the house to school and back. Lindsay, we get a chance to meet Syrian families today. I mean, how real was the need to you? I mean, just seeing it again. Yeah, it, it's very much real. I mean, I have a seven-year-old at home in Guelph, and to talk to these families today and to understand what it means for them to have lost their chance to go to school is incredibly heartbreaking. The Raho program is, is a program that provides an opportunity for Canadians to be part of our humanitarian work. And this is work in places like Somalia, like here in, in Jordan supporting Syrian refugees. And it's a program that allows us to m meet life-saving needs for children who are caught in the midst of conflict. And long term, because I mean, it's sometimes like these are the conflict zones that aren't going away. Yeah. I mean, here in Jordan, we're into the fifth year of the Syrian conflict. I mean, these children, some of these children have been out of school for that long. Um, we need to get them back in. This desperation is not even ready for advanced levels of child sponsorship. This is raw hope, the very basics of what World Vision deals with. In the context in the countries where we're um, providing raw hope programs, children are moving. They're being forced to flee and the programs that we put into place um, you know, may help a child for a time and then they need to move on. Um, but it is meeting immediate needs um, in a way that no other program is doing. 
to the, those immediate needs, I mean, where do those dollars tangibly go? Yeah, I mean, it goes to, you know, providing things like access to clean water, to life-saving food for, for those children who are severely malnourished. Um, it provides opportunities for children to have some kind of education. But thirsty minds need more than clean water. After the break, what does the future hold for Syrian university students? Stay with us. these news reports that people are forced to be converted or killed. They uh, tell them in 24 hours they have a choices to convert to Islam or to pay the ransom or they have to leave everything or face death. There are people who are staring down the barrel of a gun and being asked to renounce their faith in Christ or to die. Your chance to help this refugee crisis begins with an email. Please write to refugee sponsorship at cmacan.org. As the sun rises in Jordan, a new day does not bring new beginnings. Thousands of young Syrian students are losing hope as time passes them by. We might return back to Syria really late, so we would have by then lost uh, so many years. You have to keep in mind that before the civil war, students in Syria were thriving. In fact, there was a 95% literacy rate for kids between the age of 15 to 24. Now for women, there was even more ample opportunity. More than half of the university population were females. Noura was just 30 days away from completing high school when her father decided to leave Syria. She begged him to let her stay so she could finish. Were you scared though, just you and your mom there, your dad gone? I was terrified because of the uh, bombings and the shellings and the shootings. I used to cry, get tense whenever I'm studying. It's been a very uh, nerve-wracking period for me. Noura lived through that chaos only for the chance to become a lawyer. She longs to bring justice back to her country, but how can she do that without teachers or textbooks? Even in the city, education is stalled. This Syrian educator once poured into the minds of young engineers, doctors, and architects. Now he waits at home, seemingly hopeless. It's a lost generation. Everyone is scattered, no more education. We're going towards a lost generation. And what will that mean for Syria? No future. In a tumultuous region of the world, radical groups prey off of young people with no future. Without money, transcripts, even transportation to school, these Syrian students are stuck, standing still. It's illegal for us to leave the camp. So, and if you want to study in the camp, you, you only get to reach the 11th grade. So it's like, what can we do? How will the Middle East heal when thousands of dreams are disintegrating? This is a university card. Yes. Mohammed was once a dreamer. Now the 23-year-old only has these papers to show for his two years in the classroom. Basically, I wanted to become a lawyer since I was a child, since elementary school. That was my dream, that was my wish. A wish that crumbled once these brothers crossed borders. It's been three years since Mohammed has opened a university textbook. Psychologically, I got depressed uh, because I knew that I would not be the person I wanted to be. 
If Mohammed wants his official transcripts, he will have to risk his life and go back to his homeland. A third brother in this family is still in Syria. He stayed to study, but now he's stuck. Your brother's risking his life to be in a place for education. I mean, do you feel the same way? At first, one would risk for it, but then when you actually evaluate and see the whole situation, you kind of lose hope. Even if these brothers retrieve their transcripts, the young men cannot afford university. They're technically not even allowed to work in Jordan, but they do so under the table, just to bring in some income. I've asked about the universities here in Jordan. It would cost roughly about 2,000 JDs per year per person. It's more expensive than in Syria. Still, if Mohammed saves enough, he'll go back no matter what the cost. You would start all over again if it meant you could finish university. Certainly. Some students like Amar come from a more affluent background. Oh, okay, so you finished high school in Yemen? Yeah. With a 97 in English? Oh. <laughs> That's pretty good. That's great. That's awesome. This may have helped pay for school in the beginning, but after four years, Funds are running low. I'm frustrated and depressed because university is asking for money and I've reached the fifth month and I still can't afford to pay for it. He fled to Damascus, then Yemen, and now Jordan for school. Do you think it's possible to return home soon? Going back home became a wish, just like education. Day after day, dreams like Amar's are slowly being chipped away at. Amar is forced to take the next semester off. He will work and try to save up for school. The area here is 5.3 square kilometer. It's nearly the size of a city or a small city. Although we don't like to refer to it as a city, but it looks like it. The capacity now, I mean, we are, we've reached 82,500 refugees. Over in Zattery, Jordan's largest refugee camp, activities are more organized, but formal school for university students is still not available. Of course, here we have uh, many classes. Mm -hmm. Every day we have here uh, drawing classes, and craft classes here. And uh, next to it, it's Arabic uh, lesson. We also have 15, 15 students every day. Okay. And the next here, the lab, the computer lab. Is there a waiting list for people to take advantage of these activities? Of course, we have a waiting list. 100 names, actually. 100 names? Yeah, yeah, of course. Because young people want something to do. Yes, it's true. But even with all these considerations, university students are not a target demographic. According to UN population counts, 18 to 59 year olds are all lumped together in one giant category. It makes it hard to even tell how many students are suffering. What we do know is that at least half of all Syrian refugees are under the age of 18, foreshadowing a generation of lost scholars down the road. Um, I'm seeing lots of young people gathering around. We obviously have lots of uh, young men around us right now. I mean, what about their education? What about digitizing education? The idea is great and we, 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 we discussed it, but we cannot have this in Zachary when we don't have a decent internet connectivity. Okay. Uh, we struggle to have a, a normal, phone, to make a normal phone call in some parts of the camp. International organizations are providing education for primary and secondary students, but many Syrians are not even buying into that. A third of all kids in this camp are not in the classroom. Teenage boys are the most at risk, with the lowest attendance rates on record. The parents, they don't see beyond uh, secondary in Zachary, since there are no good opportunities. And therefore, they, they, they want their kids to help in bringing more money to the household instead of sending them to the classroom. Staying hopeful is not only a problem for parents, but for students as well. We seem happy and we keep a smile, but inside we are all sad.
The 17-year-old had high hopes of becoming a fashion designer. She still dreams in patterns and colorful fabrics. On many occasions, I, uh, I have in my mind a certain design about a jacket or a dress, and then I, I really imagine how it should be done. Do you think that that can never happen without school? Never without school. As a master's student in Canada, I wonder, why is my world intact, my studies uninterrupted, my family safe? Deep down, I know the Syrian pain extends far beyond a lost education. And that makes me wonder, where is Jesus in all of this? Here at Context, we love to hear from you, our viewers at home. Recently, David wrote, your show is ridiculous. Hopefully no tax dollars are funding this garbage. Well, David, you'll be happy to know that our show is entirely funded by our viewers. And we'd like to take this opportunity to say how much we appreciate your donations to help us share Christian stories. Thank you for helping us make television we can all be proud of. Well, everyone except for David. This segment is brought to you by Bruce Etherington and Associates. Family harmony and philanthropy, helping you help others. Christians are scattered across the Middle East, seeking refuge and shelter from the terror in Syria. Thousands have now made Jordan their new home and local churches are responding to their specific needs. But these people are still terrified. They're scared to even share their stories out of fear of retribution back home. One brave man broke the silence. His name is Debo. This is his testimony. Maybe give us an idea about Syria. Before the civil war, before ISIS, what was life like for Christians in Syria? We were living in peace and in a secure life. Just within two, two months, we started to uh, be persecuted as a Christian. You have two choices, is to have the, your weapon and fight with them, or you have to be killed. With no options and violence on the rise, Debo was forced to flee the only place he's called home. We left the home at the night, one by one, because we were surrounded with about 30 armed people. And if they caught us, they will kill us. I have a friend, he is an engineer. His name is Samir. They killed him, uh, slaughtered him. He and his wife and his son, and many people like him. They robbed churches. I can't describe the pain we had. It was very cruel. Uh, Syria, like Jordan, it was the cradle of the Christianity. Even Jesus was uh, speaking Aramic. It is the same language I speak. Do you ever think that you're going to go home? No. No. Never. I don't have home there. I don't have identity there. I have a sad story there. I have a sister. They ripped her. Her name is Nawal. They killed her and they throw her body naked beside a mosque there. So my dad, because of that, he died from the sorrow. In an environment where arms speak to sorrow and revenge is a value, Debo says his faith challenges him to forgive. So I had to ask, had he forgiven the people that raped and killed his sister? Yeah. yeah. If I don't forgive them, I'm not a child of God. I'm not the child of Christ. It was difficult, but I, I did, because the Lord taught me to do that. That childlike attitude has helped Debo adapt. He's trying to start over, both as a refugee and as a follower of Jesus. Surprisingly, he feels stronger about his faith. 
تعلمت I learned here to be child of God الصعب على بصير سهل Difficult became easy مولي أنا مولي my children suffered a lot in Syria وصلوا لهون They came to here كمان بعد فترة وجيزة And after a while حسوا باللي أنا حسيته They felt what I felt and all of them now are true children of God. Debo is a lasting symbol of how strong the human spirit can be. From his vantage point, he has this advice about all levels of suffering. Don't lose your faith in Jesus. Stand firm to be lovers. God said, love your enemies. How do we do that though? Because I don't think that's easy. Sure, it's not easy, but Jesus taught us to love. The Lord Jesus will never forget us. Many verses in the Bible telling us about these things. When Christianity started in this region, it also knew persecution. Followers clung to the words that Jesus would never leave them nor forsake them. Centuries later, Debo anchors himself in that same scripture. I'm with you all the days to the end of the days. It's a bold promise for Syrians amidst so much uncertainty. If we grapple with the belief of an ever-present God, we must also ask ourselves, what would his hands and feet really look like? Within these beautiful streets are real stories of Syrian pain and suffering. What's unique about the families that we met is that these people have never been in poverty. They're people like you and me, students, professionals, middle-class families who's had their lives taken away from them because of this bloody civil war. Two, three, four, five years later, they still don't know when they will go home. Children, students, they are the silent victims of this war. Their futures hang in the balance. What are we going to do about that? Jesus commands us to love even the least of these. Are we really willing to do that? 11 million Syrian refugees and internally displaced persons are suffering right now. What is your role in the worst humanitarian crisis of our time? Though the need is great, this situation is not hopeless and we're giving you two ways you can help. First, if you feel called to sponsor a refugee and you can form a team of five, check in with us because we have a special agency agreement where we're bringing our viewers into a sponsoring position. Secondly, World Vision is working in the most vulnerable communities and you can make a difference of the lives of Syrian children by supporting their Raw Hope campaign. So visit our website at contextwithlornaduick.com and you can help one of two ways, sponsorship or raw hope for relief supplies right on the ground in the refugee camps. For the entire Context team, this story really matters for us. Thank you for watching and continue to pray and work for the refugees in crisis. these news reports that people are forced to be converted or killed. They uh, tell them in 24 hours they have a choices to convert to Islam or to pay the ransom or they have to leave everything or face death. There are people who are staring down the barrel of a gun and being asked to renounce their faith in Christ or to die. Your chance to help this refugee crisis begins with an email. Please write to refugee sponsorship at cmacan.org.